Hello and good evening. Welcome everybody. Fáilte. Welcome to Live Irish Myths. I'm Anthony Murphy from Mythical Ireland. This is episode number 51. Cuega is a him. It's lovely to have you all along. We're uh, on, as usual, on Friday evening. We're starting at the slightly earlier time of 7 p.m. Irish time. Hope that everybody is keeping well and that you're continuing to observe the uh, the restrictions that you're continuing to wash your hands regularly and and do your social distancing. The reason that this whole idea came about uh, was because on Thursday, the 12th of March, the Irish government announced that uh, restrictions were going to be put in place around COVID-19. Uh, and that day I did episode one to uh, hardly any audience at all. And I can't believe how much it's grown. So before we start tonight, uh, I wanted to say that Throughout all of this, I've been trying to maintain as much as possible uh, a positivity and an optimistic air. I'm an optimistic person by nature. Um, I know it's been very difficult at times. I know that it's been tremendously challenging for people. I know that, uh, especially people who are elderly, people who are uh, who have underlying medical conditions, people who are living alone. It's been quite a challenge for you. Hopefully, we've done a little something to assuage your fears, to distract you from the anxiety, uh, and and to make you just feel warm and cosy just for even a little while every day. I've just finished listening to a broadcast by the Taoiseach, the Irish Prime Minister, and uh, they've announced that on Tuesday next, the two-kilometre restriction here in Ireland is going to be uh, lengthened to five kilometres. The wonderful news is that on Tuesday, I am going to be able to visit a part of the Boyne Valley. Uh, I just just uh, I had the measuring tool out. Uh, I'm going to be able to get to Douth and almost as far as Newgrange. Uh, so when that happens, I'm going to do a live broadcast at lunchtime on Tuesday from Douth. Um, and just to breathe the air of Douth and just to feel it under my feet again. Uh, Get it together, Anthony. Come on. Anyway, it's lovely to see you. I want to say thanks to for this evening's uh, theme. I want to thank Esther Gugesberg and Federica Guy, who both suggested Queen Maeve as a topic. And what a brilliant one it is. And I'm sorry that it's taken me so long to get around to it. I want to also say thanks to Simon Tute from Monumental Ireland um, and Simon is a wonderful man and M M Monumental Ireland is a wonderful page. Um, he has helped me out of a few holes where I actually don't have a picture of a particular site. I reach out to Simon and say, listen, have you got a picture of such and such? So the picture on the graphic today is a photo of Rathcrohan, the main mound at Rathcrohan and uh, thanks to Simon for helping us with that. So we're going to delve a little bit into Queen Maeve's story. Now, you have to understand that uh, Queen Maeve, um, her story is actually quite expansive. And as a character, uh, we really would have to cover a lot of ground. I'm going to have to try and compress some of this into uh, an episode. Um, so it may be actually that we, we we might have to come back to the story of Maeve and we found that with certain uh, deities and personages haven't we where we've had to go back a little bit anyway I'm sorry about uh, I'm sorry about that I, I have regained my composure now and will start to say hello to people because there's loads of people Erica Bow was the first one to say hello on YouTube and she's been there since 18 minutes past six she's in uh, Texas where the humidity will start rising tomorrow as will the temperature which I think is good news Jackie Stevenson says hello from Southern California sounds like another interesting topic thanks so much you're very welcome Jackie Mandy McCurl says good evening from a sunny Isle of Mull spent the day sheltered from an icy north wind JP Mallory in search of the Irish dream time just sublime absolutely a fantastic book and a wonderful scholar uh, is Mallory Melissa O'Brien says hello Anthony Giagutch Mel Melissa uh, Aria says, Gia everyone, or Gia you're very welcome, Aria. Anim Freak 
T. Susiko. I can't pronounce that at all, says G. Reeve. You're very welcome along. Daniel Kedney says, hello there. Time to hear about my favourite Irish goddess. Brilliant stuff, Daniel. Kathy Mark says, happy May Day from Iowa. Mark in the calendar for Tuesday at Douth. Brilliant, Kathy. Well, you're very welcome along. Yay for your extension. Here as well from Monday, we can bail out, says Aria. That's brilliant news. Moore Girl says, hello and happy May Day to all. Sunshine and beauty here in the hills of Yellowstone. Sending you love and light and laughter for these dark feeling days. Mandy McCurl says, lunchtime Tuesday. Delighted for you. Yeah, it should be good. And greetings from Germany. Anim Freak Susiko. I can't pronounce your name. I'm very sorry. Uh, the Curious Kel says, Bialton, a blessing to all. And I did say to you the other day that, yes, today is May Day. And of course, a lot of people celebrate Bialtana today. And of course, it's absolutely right that you should do so. So happy Bialtana to one and all. I will be marking the official cross quarter date that is Bialtana. As I said, uh, let me just get my schedule. We have three special episodes coming up to mark Bialtana. Uh, I'm going to do uh, an episode about Bialtana and the celebration of Bialtana on the 4th of May, which is Monday evening. And that is Bialtana Eve, because the 5th of May, or early in the morning at 49 minutes past midnight, is the moment of Bialtana for us. And that day, on Tuesday evening, I'm going to do an episode about Ishnak, which is very important in relation to the Ishnak fire. And on the 6th of May, I'm going to do an episode about Eru, and that's another one connected with Ishnak. So I hope you can join us for those. So hopefully the Tuesday lunchtime broadcast from Douth will be in addition to uh, the Live Irish Myths episode that evening. I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm, I'm embarrassed now about what just happened. But I'm overjoyed at the same time. And I understand that this has been a very challenging time for everybody who's uh, been watching and everybody who hasn't been watching. Um, and there are people who are far more challenged than us. We're very lucky. We have a family of seven and two dogs. We have a very busy household and a very lo loving household. Uh, and it's been it's been nice, in a way, to be cocooned together. Aaron Durrett is watching. Hello, Aaron Giegrich. Catherine Wall McManus. Hi, Anthony and Tua. Falsha, Catherine. Donna Jean Porter is along. Hello, Donna. Aaron Durrett, love the tu to the Tua. I just joined Bite Size Irish. Yay. Hello, Aaron. Roisin O'Connor Lawrence saying hello, Jugrich. Doris O'Hara. Hi, Anthony. Falcha. Judy McQueen says hello, Falcha. Judy Helen. Guinan is watching everybody. Genuflect, Your Majesty. Uh, Melanie Corpy says hello, Jugrich. Melanie. Todd Despera says hello, everyone. Hi, Todd. Demi Woe is in from Colorado. Hot and sunny here. It has been a largely nice day in Ireland. Uh, the showers have avoided us here in Drogheda. Uh, it was sunny and warm uh, with a little bit of a breeze. Kristen Gray Tiger says, hi, Anthony and Tua. Really looking forward to Queen Maeve stories. Nice to have you along, Kristen. Jim Conway is in Lurgan. Hi, Jim. Uh, hi, Helen says, hi, Anto and all the listeners. Uh, Laura McCormick says, yeah, yay, Friday greetings to the Tua and the Bard in Chief. Lovely to join you, dear friends, from stormy Killinall in South Tipperary. Ooh, not far from Limerick then and, and that area that we got very interested in the other night uh, pertaining to um, uh, Knuck Anya and Loch Gur, etc. Freya Stjoholm says, very good evening, Anthony. A pleasure to be here as usual. Banachty to you and our lovely Tua. And indeed, Banachty to all who are watching. Rowan Grove says, hello from sunny Colorado. I decorated my Hawthorne yesterday. Sounds lovely. <laughs> what did you decorate it with? Jack Durkin says, hi, everyone. Fold you, Jack. Barbara Barney's in the house. Hello, Barbara. Maeve Fina Callan. Trunonawa. Tom Sean Shu. Ah, Maeve. Lovely to have you. Jack Durkin says, sorry, I'm late. You're not late. We've only just started, Jack. It's great to have you along. Mariana Dunn. Hello, dear Anthony and Artua. And hello, Tussa Fane. Fall to Mariana. Sai B says, good evening, Gia Glitch. Francis Smith, Mythflix, till the 18th of May. Yes. Oh, that's the other thing I forgot to mention is that the current restrictions are going to be, well, the five kilometer limit and the forced cocooning of the elderly are, are ending on Tuesday. But on the 18th of May, more normality returns with the opening of building sites and hardware stores and garden centres and stuff like that. So gradually, there's a plan over the next, I think it's 15 weeks, to reopen everything. Sharon Bogginstitch, blessed. Bialtana, Anthony and Tua, planning a bonfire here in Redding, California later. It doesn't get too, if it doesn't get too hot, don't want to start any wildfires. Yeah, good idea, Sharon. We are going to have, I forgot to mention that, on the uh, evening of the Tuesday, the 5th of May, which is the official day of Bialtana, after the live Irish mitts, we're going to light a little fire here in our chimney, and we're going to invite people 
uh, all the two uh, Mitflix uh, viewers to light their own little fire, or if you can't light a fire, to light a candle. Uh, and we're going to do that. And we'll broadcast the fire from here. And hopefully you'll all be able to join in and we'll celebrate Bialtana together. Abigail Van Cleef says, happy Bialtana from Toronto. Lovely to have you along, Abigail. Todd Desper says, that's great news, Anthony. And Melanie says, that would be wonderful. And Demi Woe says, yay, a little more freedom. Roisin O'Connell Lawrence says, that's ah, OK. We all feel that way. Love to you. I just couldn't compose myself. Anyway, there you go. Dawn Hilton says, hi, Anthony. Hi, everyone. Gia Gwich, Dawn. Louise Sherrill says, hello again. Fulja, uh, uh, Arish, Arash, Arish. <laughs> I'm always mixing those two up. Melanie Corpy says, it's OK. You are fine. Take a deep breath. Yes, exactly. Helen says, we all feel it, Anthony Murphy, and you kept us going. Thank you. Uh, I'm delighted, Helen, and uh, I can't wait to the day that we're back in the office uh, and I'm bowing properly in front of you again. Barbara Kling says, hello, Anthony, and everyone checking in from Vermont. Lovely to see you, Barbara. Josephine Meehan says, hi, Anthony and Tua. Hi, Josephine. Catherine Wall McManus, great news, big hugs. Yvette Tillema, hi, friends and Anthony. It's wonderful to be here from Keen in New York. Keen to be here and keen for stories. Uh, Fault you, Yvette. Sharon Boggins Stitch says, great news, Anthony. Roll on Tuesday. Yeah, Mariana Dunn, glad to hear some restrictions can can change for all of you in Ireland. Kristen Gray Taggart, I feel the same emotions, Anthony. Don't be embarrassed. I would give so much to be in Ireland right now. Sometimes when I listen to your stories, it pulls me so strongly. It, it pulls, pulls at me so strongly that I feel it in my chest. Yeah, that's the way I feel sometimes. Todd Desper is also saying blessed Bialtana to all. Molly Michelle Kopeski is saying blessed Bialtana e evening. Uh, you're very welcome uh, along, uh, Molly. And Banachti uh, Bialtana Tosafain. Did I just hear you say you had the measuring tool out, Anthony? Uh, yeah, that's the one on, on uh, Google Earth, uh, the ruler tool. Gavin Duffy, it's okay, Anthony. You'll be back there soon. Yeah, exactly, uh, uh, Gavin. Uh, I, Gavin, I, I, I thought at one point I was to give you my email address, and I didn't see an email from you. Hopefully, uh, I didn't. Hopefully, you got the right address. Or, or I must just check in case it went into spam. I wouldn't think so, though. Ralph Waldron says, "Good evening from Ath League, the best." Place in Ireland, and there's no doubt about it. Looking forward to another evening of mythology. Hi, Ralph. Aaron Pixie Cusick says hello, and Banachti. Banachti Tussafane, Aaron, it's lovely to have you along. Alex Casterton, evening, Anthony. Hope you're okay. Seeing your head down, I was worried for a second. No, no, I just got emotional because the restrictions are being uh, extended, uh, or not extended, uh, relaxed on Tuesday, and I'm going to be able to go to Douth, uh, which is brilliant, uh, and maybe. Uh, a good bit of the way to Newgrange, and I'll get sight of it, uh, if if not right up to it. Good evening, Anthony, uh, says Nick Eska Casterton. Hope you and yours are doing okay, and hi to the Tua. Falcha, Nick. Barb Jordan says, hey, happy Friday. Happy Friday. Jehina, uh, brilliant stuff. Nice to see you, Barb. Liz Pierce, hello from a chilly northeast of England. Hi, Liz. Uh, Falcha. Good evening, Anthony. And all the mythical to us, some positive news today. We are the people we will overcome together. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. And it's lovely to see you. Kathy May Deoy says, Deo says, good evening, Anthony, from Newcastle in Washington State in USA. Oh, we have lots of Washington staters who watch uh, Mythflix. Dawn Hilton, and it's great to have you along, Kathy. Dawn Hilton is in Lancashire. Hi, Dawn. Falcha. Donna K. Kelly is in Greer in South Carolina. Falcha. Donna. Kathy May Dayo, and oh, and happy May Day, of course, and, and to you uh, uh, as well. Josephine Meehan is also saying happy May Day. Right here with you, our chieftain Anthony says here. <laughs> Catherine Wall McManus, Bialtana blessings, everyone. Joan Cat O'Brien, greetings from the Berkshire Hills of Massachusetts in the US of A. Gia Rich, Joan, nice to have you along. Heather Garen Rice is in Lancaster. Gra Congratulations on being able to walk on the sacred sites. Bialtana blessings from our celebration in Pennsylvania. Lovely to see you again, Heather. Always a pleasure. Marie Hughes, all better now. Happy May Day from Montgomery County in Pennsylvania. Brilliant stuff, Marie. Josephine Meehan, Bialtana blessings. Caitlin Moon, I name all of my harps after mythological figures. My modern harp is Maeve after her. It has a dragon head. Wow, fascinating. Love to see some pictures of those. Caitlin Veronica Casey says, hey, my family will be happy there. Brilliant. Jacek Miros says, hello from a rainy Warsaw. Not rainy here today, thankfully. But uh, sure, hopefully the sun will shine for you tomorrow, Jacek. Nice to see you anyway. And Mike and Jeanette are watching from Princeton in New Jersey. Hello and good evening to both of you. Always a great pleasure. 
No need to be embarrassed, Anthony, says May, Fina, Callan. Vanessa Buff is waving. Tom King, it's healthy to show emotion, Anthony. Pamela Walters says, Banachti from the Netherlands. Good evening, Pamela. Always a great pleasure to have you in the house. Good evening, everyone. Lockdown ending 18th of May. Isn't it brilliant? Dave Russell, Anthony, we all go through that. Even living legends like myself makes you human, mate. Much love. <laughs> yeah, completely understand. Understandable. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Nick or Alex. Uh, Nancy Nee Han Hannafin is in Boston, saying Boston in the house. Always lovely to have the Bostonians on board in San Choc. Sure. The, this, it's like this house has grown to 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 facilitate all the uh, all the wonderful folk who who join us every evening. Megan Walters, I jumped over from YouTube. Hi again, hello Megan. Eva Anderson, hello from a very cold and rainy Gothenburg. Oh dear, hello uh, uh, Trononawa, Eva. Jennifer Foley says, "Do you believe, Jennifer?" Uh, Alex Casterton is saying, "Evening to her." Rowan Grove says, "Ribbons on the Hawthorn, lovely stuff." Sounds great. Margaret Ring is in the house. Good evening to all. Turn on a what, Margaret? Mark Kavanagh, have you read The Farm by Loch Gur by Mary Carberry? Great info on local myths, etc. I haven't. And I'm going to have to add that to my uh, my reading list. Hang on until I take a note of it. What's it called? The Farm by Loch Gur. Now, just, can we just keep that between ourselves? Like, strictly between us, that I'm thinking of buying more books for the library. I don't want my wife to hear. <laughs> Mary Carberry brilliant stuff thanks for that Mark I'll have a look at that Frank Fogarty is watching Falcha Frank great work you're doing uh, with the is the Red Cross isn't it um, but fair play to you I have to say Frank is one of the bus drivers who under normal circumstances would be ferrying uh, the tourists from the Bruna Bonia Visitor Centre up to the monuments but since the monuments are closed Frank has uh, devoted his time to volunteering with the Red Cross to deliver supplies to the elderly and to deliver PPE and hand sanitizer to those who need it. Brilliant stuff, Frank, and thank you for your work. Ilara Silverbreeze says, Do you leave Anthony Augustua? Excited for the Maeve story. Well, I'm, I'm happy that you're excited, and hopefully we can feed that excitement. Patricia Healy Sullivan, excited to be tuned in on time for my favourite Queen Maeve from Bakersfield in Vermont. Love to have you in the house, Patricia. Lorna Evers Monaghan, happy first day of summer. Indeed, Lorna, and long may the summer last. Wait, what is the actual date of Bialton? And Jennifer Foley is asking. Officially in Ireland, it is at uh, 49 minutes past midnight on the 5th of May. Uh, and that is uh, Tuesday morning. So uh, we'll be doing our episode about Bialton on Monday evening. Federica Guy. Hi, Anthony. Hi, Tua. Glad to hear about Maeve, one of my favourites. We were thanking you earlier on, Federica, because you were one of two people, uh, along with Esther Guggesberg, who suggested this as a topic. So thank you for that. Maeve Callahan says, I'll be lighting the fire pit in my backyard tonight as the weather's clear and Tuesday looks to be rainy. Oh, fair enough. No problem, Maeve. Henry Paddy Shearman's in the house. Hello, Henry. Megan Walters, the fifth. Yes. Brian Murphy is watching. Good evening, Brian. How are you? Vanessa Buff. He might or might not be my brother. He is my brother, but he's younger than me. Um, Gia Reeve, I've been to Nocknery last year in August. I'm excited for this episode. Love from Germany. Very welcome, Vanessa. Lovely to see you. Okay, Lisa Collins, looking forward to lighting a fire in our pit along with our Tua soon. Brilliant stuff, Lisa. Laura Odometroy, or Odometroy says, Hello, Anthony, eager to hear another mythical adventure. And Laura is in Blessington. And I love the fact that a place name has the word bless in it. It sounds like a blessed place. Laura, welcome along. The astronomical dates, not the calendar dates, says Megan. Yeah, uh, the astronomical date of 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 Bialton is is uh, Tuesday morning. Aaron Dress, take the drone with you. Yes, correct, Aaron. Yes, absolutely. Melanie Lynn is watching. Hi, Melanie. Good to see. You. I hope you're in good form. Serena Swift is in Washington State. Another Washington Stater. Uh, though from the west coast of the states to the east coast of Ireland, Serena swiftly joins us. Hello, Serena. Kelly Nikiali, another W A Stater here. They're all in tonight. The whole of Washington State is watching. Brilliant stuff, Kelly. Lovely to have you along. Nora Gaffney O'Connor. Good evening. How goes it? Wonderful news about five kilometers. I can get back to my sea swimming. Happy days. Can't wait to hear about Maeve. She was some woman for one woman. Indeed she was. 
Okay, Patricia Mazurek says, Good evening from a cold and rainy Belgium. Tornonoa, Patricia. Lucy Robinson is saying, Devon checking in. Falcha, Lucy. You can never have too many books, says Serena Swift, and people are laughing. Uh, Margaret Ring says, I found the sword. <sighs> Sounds interesting. Okay, okay. Uh, I think the wife will figure it out, says Ilara Silverpiece. <laughs> I won't tell your wife about the books if you don't tell my husband. <laughs> uh, that's that's a deal, Heather. Lucy Robinson, God help you if the wife starts listening in. She does listen occasionally. She's in the kitchen. I have to keep my voice down. <laughs> Maeve is anglicized to Maeve. How is that? Well, Donna, the way it works is uh, there's a lenition. So uh, when you see M-E-D-B, what you should be thinking about is M-E-D-H-B-H, Maeve. Uh, uh, and, and it's not that it's anglicized, it's how it's pronounced in Irish because of something that we call lenition, which is basically in the in the olden days, they used to put a dot over the consonant to be lenited, uh, which was called a shavu. So in the older scripts, even a century ago in, in Irish, they used to write these shavus, but then they started writing a H. Uh, so M-E-D-H-B-H, sorry, M-E, yes, M-E-B-H-D-H, which would be pronounced Maeve. Do you have the serpent and the goddess? If not, I'd like to gift it to you. Thank you for your generosity of knowledge. The serpent and the goddess. Is that the one by Mary Condren, Kelly? Uh, sorry, I, I, we'll get started on the episodes. The YouTube, some of the YouTube commenters have been complaining about having to listen to all the hellos at the start. I don't know what people are like. Uh, the serpent and the goddess. If that's Mary Condren, I believe I do. It's very, very nice of you, Kelly. But I do have it. It is in my collection. Um, but I tell you what, you could do. We could, we could, uh, we could have a, a little Facebook competition, couldn't we? And give it away to one of the two, uh, who would be very glad to have it. Uh, okay. Will it be 3.49 a.m. for us in EST? What, uh, I can't remember what time it is in Eastern, I have to say. Uh, well, you're generally five hours behind us, so um, seven. Seven. Sorry, I've totally lost my train of thought. 7.49 p.m. on Monday, is that right? We had our first... We had our stay at home extended here in Minnesota, so my friends and I are planning to meet over Zoom on May the 4th and light candles together since we can't get together for a bonfire. Brilliant idea, Molly. Annie Newton says, hi, everyone. Fall to Annie. Patricia McAteer is watching. Lovely to see you, Patricia. Thank you for sharing your wonderful artwork on the Mythical Ireland community earlier. Lovely stuff. Margaret says her books are her babies. <laughs> right, okay. Now I think it's time to start. Oh my God, we're in 23 minutes. Right. We better get started. So, I'm starting. Ah, let's just get started. Let's not even introduce it anymore. Let's just start talking about Maeve, because that's what we're here for, aren't we? Maeve of Connacht, and this is immediately stirring controversy because is she Maeve of Connacht or is she not? <laughs> Early in the present century, a distinguished Celticist wrote a scathing commentary on the morals of the ancient Irish, basing his remarks on the evidence of the early sagas. He dealt at particular length with the legendary Queen Maeve of Connacht, she who led her armies against Ulster in the saga Toynbo Cúlnge. And it is indeed true that Maeve's sexual capacity receives considerable emphasis in the literature. As well as being the paramour of the prodigiously virile hero Fergus Mac Rourke um, and others, she is said to have claimed that, quote, never was she without one man in the shadow of another, unquote. 
and to have always sought a husband, quote, without niggardliness, without jealousy, and without fear, unquote. But Maeve's legend is not a historical document, nor indeed is she herself the historical personage she purports to be. In fact, this is one of the not infrequent instances where bad morals make good mythology. And it is precisely in her breaches of propriety that we find the clearest evidence of Maeve's divinity. Her licentiousness is merely the literary expression of one of the characteristic functions of the Celtic goddess. Now, I have to tell you this. I, I, I got great. I got great fun. I have to. That, 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 I definitely have to tell you this. So, um, uh, in relation to last night's episode, uh, on a Masticon Gaelicum, uh, somebody watched it today on YouTube, and then made a comment. What a pity that the first twenty minutes is spent on greetings. My time is precious. <laughs> and I answered, <laughs> forgive me, I just couldn't resist. And I answered, so precious that you wasted more of it making that comment. <laughs> I just don't understand some people. It's like, you know, either fast forward or, you know, do what you have to do, you know. <laughs> Francis Chute is watching. Hi, Francis. Tranona Watt, I hope you're keeping well. Uh, I'm sorry, I just had to share that. I just thought that was funny. My time is precious, so I'm going to waste more of it making snide remarks. <laughs> it, is all, it has often been remarked that the Celts had no goddess of love, no Venus or Aphrodite, though on the other hand, the majority of their goddesses display a vigorous sexuality. Similarly, Early Irish offers surprisingly little literature of love in the conventional sense. It is true that it has numerous tales of wooings, elopements, etc. But these deal with the circumstances of the erotic encounter rather than with the personal relationship involved. The poetry of passionate love. I'm sorry, that was very devious of me, but I just couldn't resist. It's like, you know, you know, the trolls on YouTube, they just like... They just love trying to stir it up, you know. And I just thought, well, if you're going to make a stupid comment like that, I'll show you up for it. <laughs> I mean, I'm a nice guy most of the time. But, you know, sometimes you can test my patience. But these deal with the circumstance of the erotic encounter rather than with the personal relationship involved. The poetry of passionate love may very well have existed in popular song, which is practically unattested for. The er for the early period. But in the mainstream of Irish literary tradition, it receives only the barest recognition. It is not unlikely, indeed, that the two phenomena, the literary and the mythological, are connected. Since the heroines of the love tales are, for the most part, divine, it is natural, then, that the narratives should reflect the mythological role of love, which is, of its nature, functional or ritual rather than personal and in point of fact it is only in the hands of the monastic literateurs and under the influence of foreign romantic genres that the personal and psychological aspects of love are gradually more fully elaborated <laughs> uh. <laughs> I'm glad you all you're all enjoying that too. I just couldn't resist the mythological role. So if you're watching this episode and you're fed up of the first what was it 23 minutes of greetings, don't bother leaving a comment, please. <laughs> Keep it to yourself. <laughs> the mythological role of love and sexuality is bound up primarily with the character of the Irish goddess as divine mother and personification of the land and this is critically important. The cult of the mother goddess is attested in Gaul from prehistoric times. It may also have preceded the Celts in Ireland, and equally it may have accompanied them there, but in any event its presence is hardly in doubt. The divine people, the Tuatha were reputed to be the family or descendants of the goddess Danu, as the Welsh gods were said to be issued from Dun, 
or the Indian from Aditi, and Wales, like Gaul, had its great mother, Modron, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly, M-O-D-R-O-N. David Gilroy is watching Falchitahi Conestatu. In Irish literature, Danu is frequently confused with Anu, who is described in Cormac's glossary as the mother of the Irish gods, Mater Deorum Hiberne Hibernensium, and in the Cor Anmon, or Aunon, fitness of names, as the goddess of prosperity, to whom the province of Munster owed its wealth and fertility. Anu's identification with the earth is brought out even more explicitly in the name of a Kerry mountain, the Paps of Anu, Da Kirch Anan. Now, just in case I'm missing any comments, just let me just quickly scroll. People don't always understand what community is. It's not all about being efficient with our time, says Kelly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Megan says, the sharper side of Irish wit. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I have a very devious, uh, sarcastic side. <laughs> and my brother Brian is watching, and, and uh, he, 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 he knows all about it. <laughs> He's been on the receiving end of it a few times. Uh, sorry. Buffering badly on Facebook. So jumping over to YouTube, says Aaron Durrett. Hopefully that's just you, Aaron, and not a uh, universal difficulty. Yeah. <laughs> Which book, please? Oh, sorry, Yvette. Uh, this uh, moment I'm reading from Pontius Macana's Celtic Mythology which is a wonderful, wonderful book. And I'm very lucky to have it in my collection. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize that was going to be. Yeah, anyway, uh, I enjoyed that. And I'm glad you enjoyed it. But this equation of the goddess and the earth is normally defined and limited by local affiliations. At its most extensive, it comprises the domain of the cultural nation, in other words, the land of Ireland, in which sense it is most clearly exemplified in the trio of divine eponyms Eru, Fola, and Banba, or Banva. And we will be dealing with those on the 6th, which is, what is that? That's Wednesday, isn't it? Yes, we have an episode on Eru on the 6th of May, but obviously Eru is one of three, who reigned over Ireland at the coming of the Gaels, that is the Milesians. In general, however, the innumerable goddesses known to tradition tend to be associated with certain localities, a province, a district, a river, or a particular place, and we saw that with Anya two nights ago, and modern folklore still retains vivid memories of fairy queens, such as Anya, <laughs> speak of the devil, or speak of the queen, who had her seat at Knuck Anya, and lovely to see it written in the Irish rather than in the anglicised version, in County Limerick, Eivall of Cra Cra Craig Lea in Kildare, and Cleana of Carrig Cleana in Cork. The significant point is that in these instances, the ruler of the supernatural realm is a goddess rather than a god, precisely as in those early Irish tales which represent the other world as, quote, the land of women, unquote. It is evidently an old tradition and one which proved remarkably tenacious, and it seems to confirm that the notion of a great goddess who was mother of the gods is a basic element of insular Celtic mythology. Now, just on that point, if you saw the graphic for today's episode, you'll see it on YouTube and you'll have seen me sharing it on Facebook earlier on. There's a, a sort of a, a line drawing or a pencil drawing of a lady superimposed onto the aerial image of Rathcrohan Mount. That is Queen Maeve, as she was represented on the Irish one pound note, the Irish punt, which was the currency here in Ireland until the coming of the euro, which I think was in, was that 2002 the euro was introduced in Ireland? Uh, so until that time, and I remember as a kid, <laughs> I remember when I was, uh, I was, when I was spending my first communion money, I went into a toy shop and I remember asking the gentleman behind the counter, how much was this particular toy? And he just went like this, three green ones. <laughs> and of course, green was the color of the punt, you know? Uh, well, it was the color, it was the color of the one pound note. Uh, and so we had Maeve on the most common unit of our notes, our Irish pound notes, uh, until the coming of the euro. So that goes to show you uh, what an important role that she had. Uh, and one might have expected that 
we might have a, a religious figure such as Our Lady, you know, uh, or something similar. Uh, no, not on our currency. Uh, we, we put Maeve, who was very, very, uh, we're very endeared to uh, over a long period of time. One consequence of this priority is that the goddess often assumes a dominating role vis-a-vis -vis her male partners. An obvious instance is Maeve, whose husbands are never more than sleeping partners. Another, expressed in more graphic terms, is the monstrous couple who appear in several of the early tales and whose appearance is, on each occasion, fraught with evil consequence. I didn't know she was on the pound note. There you go, Maeve. Yep. Um, and uh, I have the complete picture. Uh, I can't do that now, but I'll do it afterwards. I'll share. I think it's okay to do that now because it's not legal currency anymore. I actually have a picture of uh, the 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 old Irish uh, punt note, which is where I got the, the drawing from to superimpose on the graphic. In Thornbo Cúlinge, the woman rides while her husband walks, and when they are challenged by Cúchulam, it is she who answers in his stead. In Branwen, the man is described as huge and terrible in appearance, but despite his size, his wife is twice as big. The legend describes to her two of the common attributes of the Celtic goddess, fertility and warlike vigour, and her name appears to confirm the combination. Uh, I can't pronounce that because it's Welsh. C-Y-M-I-D-E-I-C-Y-M-E-I-N-F-O-L-L. -E -E it looks like Kaimidai Kaiminfol, which means big bellied battler. <laughs> Goddesses of war. And uh, we will shortly depart from Makona to go down and to read something else. The warlike propensity of the goddess is variously expressed. There is the quasi historical Maeve, ruthless commander in chief of the armies which she sends against Ulster. Her very appearance deprived warriors of two thirds of their valor. <laughs> So they only had to clap eyes on her and they got chicken. <laughs> there are Amazonian teachers of the martial arts like Boanam, the lasting one, mother of heroes, and Skahawk, the shadowy one, who we encountered in one of our early episodes, which was about uh, Kuholan's training with Skahawk. And on that point, I forgot to make my usual mention of the fact that all of the previous episodes of Live Irish Myths can be seen in one place on the Mythical Ireland blog, and I'm going to post that into YouTube just there now, that link, and indeed I will post it as soon as the page scrolls down and I can see, yes, I will post it here on Facebook as uh, a link also. And Katrina has joined us. La bui bialtana gachtina. Falcha, Katrina, and happy bialtana to you. Uh, sorry, uh, Skahawk. See, see how easily I get distracted. Skahawk and her training of Cucullin was was early enough, wasn't it? Skahawk and Cucullin was actually episode three of Live Irish Myths. The shadowy one who ran finishing schools for young heroes. It was under Skahawk's tutelage that Cucullin acquired the special skills that later extricated him from many dangerous situations. And that is where we leave Prunchus McConnell. And now we're going to uh, introduce uh, the topic of Maeve in relation to how the Toynbo Kulnia began. Terry Lynn says, got here late from Colorado. Happy Bialtana. Uh, and uh, happy Bialtana to you, Terry Lynn. Fault you. And it's better to be late than never to arrive at all. And this is from that book that I spoke about, I think, in the first uh, of the multiple uh, tour of my library videos. Uh, we've only done one so far, and that is Ireland, A Journey into Lost Time by P.A. Osiachon. And I'm reading from chapter 31. It was Eileen, Queen Maeve's consort, who started it with the teasing remark, truth to tell, young lady, but it is not good to, is it not good to be the wife of a fine man? He was bragging. But whatever had happened just before, Maeve was not in a serene mood. Tartly, she replied, Why so? How stupid men can be at such times. <laughs> Ileel responded, Because you are now better off than the day I took you. Maeve reacted as a woman would. That is not so. 
My father was the High King of Ireland. Of his six daughters, Derbru, Ethne, Ella, Clochru, Mugoin, and myself, I was the noblest and fairest, the most generous, the best in battle, in personal combat, and feats of valour. Ailil detailed his princely pedigree. Maeve stated the size of her standing army and how, because of her personal worthiness, she was given the province of Connacht. In turn, the kings of Ulster, Tara, Leinster and other noblemen had sought her hand in marriage, but she had refused them all because she demanded a wondrous bride gift in the man she would marry, namely that he should be without fear, without jealousy and without blemish. For she herself was victorious in combat, generous in gift, without jealousy, and she was never without one man in the shadow of another. Maeve was generous in spirit as as well, as she added, I found that man in you, Eilil, son of Rossa Rui of Leinster. You were not afraid, you were not jealous, and you were not lazy. I gave you bridal gifts of raiment for 12 men, a chariot worth thrice seven cummels, and a cummel was a unit of value equal to two or three milk cows, the breath of your face in red gold, and the size of your left arm in white bronze, as well as my consort, you gained the province of Connacht. Eileen, in return, detailed the bridal gift he had brought her. We can almost hear their voices in the quiet of the night that was soon shattered as they called their households out of bed to fetch and compare their possessions. There was no sleep that night, no peace the next day. Nothing was left out from their, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> from their bracelets, thumb rings and treasures of gold. Their garments of purple and blue, black and green, yellow and grey, dun and checkered and striped, down to the very vats, watch, washing basins and tubs. From the hills and plains, fields and lawns, rounded up and counted, were their great flocks of sheep, their herds of cattle and swine and their horses. All were found to be of equal value, save only one special bull, the Finn Bianach the white horned or the bright horned, sorry, of Eilil, of whom it is related that a calf of one of Maeve's cows, not wishing to remain a woman's possession, he had taken his place with Eilil's herd of cows. And that, in truth, is what the story says. And that was the cause of the ensuing great conflict. Chagrined, Maeve called her herald, Macroth, and charged him to find her at least the equal of the Finbanach. He did so, but it was an Ulster bull, the Don Coilne, owned by one Dara Macfachna, who would not sell it. Maeve instructed Macroth to return to Dara Macfachna, taking with him a company of nine horsemen, off with you there now, and request a loan of the bull for one year, for which she would give Dara Macfachna fifty cows a chariot worth thrice seven cummels, land on the plain of Magai, or my, my E, equal to his own land, and as well, the friendship of her thighs. Some things are expressed in colourful language. Dara Macfachna readily accepted the generous offer and provided Macroth and his company with lavish hospitality. Now, fear not, I know that... Uh, by the way, I did a count... Uh, we are on episode 51 of Live Irish Myths. There are, believe it or not, 74 topics that have been suggested that we haven't covered yet, either at all or in detail. Uh, and I know that one of those is Tornbo Kulnia. Uh, and I'm not intending to read the whole Tornbo Kulnia tonight, but this is funny. Michael Murphy says... I was uh, he was at the doctor's and was driving home. Not probably not a good idea to watch it while while driving. So I'll watch it later. Hi guys, fall to Michael, and I hope you're keeping well. Oh my God, shocking! Says Nora. <laughs> Sorry, Dara Macfachna readily accepted the generous offer and provided Macroth and his company with lavish hospitality. Unfortunately, during the banquet, one of Macroth's company was heard to boast that if they had not received the Don Coolinga on loan, he would have been taken by force. 
Enraged, Dara MacFochna withdrew his agreement and MacRoth returned empty-handed to the Queen's Palace at Roth Crochen. And that is the monument that you can see on the graphic for today's episode. It was then that Maeve assembled her army the men of, of the men of Aaron, and it is then that this epic story really begins. And we are not going to tell that story because that would be uh, uh, spoiling the yet to come telling of Toynbo Kulinga, which could take us quite a number of episodes, so we might break it up. Ah, yes, 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 yes. It's great fun, though, isn't it? So, like, there can be quite a lot of humor in the mythology, you know. The Tua are all about the stories. Sure, they are endless. Completely right. Imagine that we've done 51 episodes and I still have 74 topics. And like included in those topics is, for instance, Toynbo Kulnia, which may take us as many as eight or ten episodes to get through. Um, it's extraordinary. It's plenty of time. Sure, we'll keep doing it so long as we're, you know, see how long we go on. The friendly thighs. It's a funny way. It's a funny way of... Uh, expressing something. Would you class Maeve as a goddess or a more ancestral figure? Or is there a goddess called Maeve as well as Queen Maeve? Well, I, I think that uh, what McConaughey was saying there uh, was that, um, you know, at times she appears to be a historic personage and a queen, etc. And there are various versions of her in various places that she's associated with. So, for instance, Queen Maeve's Kern and Knocknaray and Sligo. You know, she's associated with Rath Crohan. She's also associated with the Hill of Tara, Rath Maeve at Tara. Um, but that ultimately you can trace her back into prehistory to this sovereignty goddess Maeve, uh, I think is what he's trying to say. Maeve is the mythical queen of Connacht and a leading character in the Ulster cycle. Her name originally meant one who intoxicates and was used to denote the goddess of sovereignty. Early Irish sources symbolized the gaining of kingship as drinking ale proffered by an otherworld lady. Her cult as a symbol of sovereignty was very old and her name in its original form, Meduva, M-E-D-U-V-A, was known among the continental Celts of antiquity. One medieval Irish text seems to echo this, describing Maeve as racing against horses. And where have we seen that story, folks? We've seen that story uh, in relation to Macha at our Macha, uh, who also races horses, uh, while heavily pregnant with twins, by the way. And that's a story we will get round to, because I believe Macha is one of the subjects for discussion in a later episode. The combination of her representing ritual ale and horses must reflect some kingship symbolism, for the meaning horse mead is found in a Gaulish royal title, Epomedos, E-P-O-M-E-D-O-U-S, or U-O-S, should I say, as well as in the title of the Hindu inauguration ritual, Asvameda. A character called Maeve Lachjarg was associated with Tara, and a fortress there was called Rahmave after her. Her epithet means half red and probably referred to the bloody contests for the Tara kingship. She is represented as having had several husbands, a typical role for a personification of sovereignty, and one medieval text gives an apposite description of her role. Quote, great indeed, was the strength and power of that Maeve over the men of Ireland, for it was she who would not allow a king in Tara unless he had her as wife, unquote. Um, and isn't there, um, in addition to the places that we were discussing, isn't there a Mascon Maeve, and there are several of those, uh, which means, does that mean Maeve's butter hump or something like that? Mascon Maeve, any of the Dunagallers in the house, what's the name of that flat-topped mountain in Donegal? Um, not Errigal, because that's not flat-topped. Um, Muckish, is it? Am, am I right? If somebody point me in the right direction. Isn't there a cairn on the top of Muckish Mountain in Donegal that's called Mascon Maeve? Please correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, as usual, uh, I have to declare that I am not a scholar. I, 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 I don't have a degree or a PhD in any of this. I am merely an enthusiast like yourselves. The text further describes her as a shrewd and wise woman being fierce and merciless. 
that description would be appropriate also to her namesake, Maeve of Crochen, i.e. Rathcrochen, County Roscommon. This queen of the province of Connacht was also said to have several husbands, to have had several husbands, and in literature invariably portrays her as a great manipulator of men and adept, an adept at power and intrigue. Dave Russell is saying muckish, yes. So, so that's the one. Moreover, she is said to have been reared at Tara, and there is little doubt but that Maeve of Tara and Maeve of Crochen were one and the same personage. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah, a few people confirming that it was Muckish, all right. The Seven Sisters range, says Dave. Yes, Muckish, yes, says Josephine Meehan. Yeah, that's one. And isn't there a cairn on the top of it called Mascon Maeve, which I believe... I'm going to Katrina will be jumping in here. I hope M E A S G A N is it something like that? Can't immediately find it using uh, a Google search, but uh, perhaps somebody will help me in that regard. Josephine says, climbed it two years ago. Brilliant stuff. I saw it from a distance while traveling through Donegal on several occasions, and always said. What a, a, a strange and wonderful looking mountain, you know. On Vukish, says Katrina, meaning the pig's back. Yes, indeed. And I wonder, is that to do with the story that when the Milesians were coming to Ireland and when they were still out at sea, the two of the Danon uh, transformed themselves into, uh, into uh, uh, pigs who merged in with the landscape uh, so that to confuse the, uh, to confuse the uh, Milesians. Paddy, Henry Paddy Shearman says, I asked for an episode on Macha. Yes, absolutely, Henry, which we will get round to hopefully soon enough. Brilliant stuff. Many cairns around Northern Ireland too, Anthony. Morns are one, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I believe there are several of these Mascon Mavis, and I can't... I, I, I'm annoyed now that I, I can't, that I haven't been able to get it right, and I'm looking for it. Uh, I, I'm probably I'm probably spelling it wrong. No, I still can't find it. Anyway, I'm not going to spend too much time because I know I'm distracting you guys from your uh, story time, which is more important. We'll get back to it. Oh, there's Katrina saying Mascon Maeve. Their name for the cairn was Mascon Maeve, a name also applied to the cairn on Muckish Mountain in Donegal, and meaning Maeve's butter pat. Yeah, that's the one, Katrina. And Gillian Gogarty is watching. Uh, uh, good evening, Gillian Falche. Um, I, I, I hope that I haven't uh, uh, mislaid or misdirected some of you because we do start an hour earlier on a Friday and, and I know that some people are late and, and I hope it's not because I didn't give you notice. Um, Muvanway says, I, Muvanway, sorry, I'm trying to get this pronunciation right. Muvanway said, I had a very good tour of Rathcrohan in the cold and driving rain, hearing all about Maeve. Just me and the guide, who'd also written a very colourful book on the site. He finished off by encouraging me down the cave of the cats. I told him I wasn't going down there, but curiosity got the better of me. Fantastic stuff. Sorry, I've lost my place now. That's what happens when I get distracted. I really, I'm really, I'm really sorry about this, folks, and to the YouTubers who are watching afterwards, and who are turning your eyes to heaven and toting and blowing and all that. Sorry about that. Symbolizing the Tara kingship, the power struggle between the Connachta sept that ruled there and the Uli of the north brought her cult into contact with that of the mythical Ulster king Fergus MacRoch. This power struggle of the 4th and 5th century is reflected in the Toynbo Cúlnia, a prose epic describing a cattle raid and interprovincial war that was first assembled around the year AD 600, when the name of the Connacht Sept had become synonymous with the Western province. Thus, tradition came to situate Maeve's power centre at Crochen. Regarding her husband's, her husband's, one recension of the Toyn has her boasting Oh, yeah, we've had that quote several times over. I never was without one man in the shadow of another. And she attempts to gain the great bull of Cooley, the Don Cooling, by offering its owner the friendship of my thighs. One early account states that Fergus deserted his native province out of lust for her. 
It is clear that the dramatic potential of portraying her as a sex object was recognised from an early date and that she quickly developed from a single symbol of sovereignty into an attractive and cunning woman. We are told that her husbands in consecutive order were Conkovar MacNessa or Conor MacNessa or Crohor MacNessa, Tinya MacConrock, Yochi Dala and Eileel Machvata or Mata. Very interesting. Yes, that's a, an episode coming soon, the Mata or the Vata. She left Konkovar after a short time of marriage, quote, due to pride of mind, unquote, and returned to Tara. Later, we are told, Konkovar visited Tara and violated her while she bathed in the river Boyne. Then one Fiochi, Fiochi, MacFaig came to woo her, but he was intercepted and slain by Tinya MacConrock, King of Connacht. Maeve's father, the High King Yochi Felach, banished Tinya to the wilderness and installed Maeve as Queen of Connacht in Crochen. Eventually, she took Tinya as husband, but he was killed by Conkovar in a battle at the River Boyne. The Boyne is so important to so many of the stories. Maeve was rescued from that battle and taken back to Connacht by Yuchi Dala, whom she then allowed to be king of the province on condition that he married her. <laughs> yeah, well, the main thing, um, Movanwe, is that you were able to get out of the cave of the cats again, you know? Margaret says, you're in great form tonight. <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. John McAndrew, I forgot uh, you run an hour late or an hour early on Friday. Late hello. Jigrich, John, yeah, sorry about that. Um, but look, not to worry, you will be able to catch up on video and we'll resume at the normal time tomorrow evening. Maeve reminds me, says Nora Gaffney O'Connor, of Cleopatra in a way. Absolutely. Vicky Wallace Southall is pulling her chair up by the fire. And Thalia Brown says, hello from Glastonbury to Anthony and Tua. I forgot about the hour. We'll watch the recording. Brilliant. Absolutely. <laughs> Megan Walters, our time is precious. <laughs> Don't go down caves with strangers. Glad you are still here, says Katrina. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good advice. Um, sorry, where were we? We read that Eileel McMata was a mere child when he was first brought to Maeve's court. His name would have a, sorry, his name would appear to have been attracted to the context of Maeve due to the famous cattle raid in the Thorn, for Eileel was the name of a great mythical patron of herds. The more general tradition claims him to have been of the Aeron people, and his father's name is given as Mata Mac Shrivgin. However, in one tract, he is described as son of the lion worthy, Ross Rua, and of a lady of the Western province called Mata Morsk. Okay, we don't give too much uh, away about the toy. And a lot of this is about the toy, actually. Her own death is described in an 11th century text. There we read that she is killed by sorry, that she killed her sister Clohra, C-L-O-T-H-R-A, who had preceded her as queen at Crochen. Clohra had resided on an island in Loch Ree on the River Shannon, but had been slain by Maeve there. A baby boy was delivered by putting swords through her side after her death, and he was called Furbai, literally the cut one. Maeve herself went to live on that island and used to bathe every morning at a spring there. Once, when a great assembly was being held on the shores of the lake, the youth Forbaya saw a beautiful woman on the island going to bathe. He inquired who she was and was told that she was his mother's sister. He had been eating cheese and on hearing this, put a hard lump of cheese in his sling and shot it with such accuracy and force that it struck her on the forehead and killed her. I'm sorry for laughing. Uh, I shouldn't laugh at, at an account of somebody's death. Uh, but, 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 but like with a lump of cheese, come on, let, let's, let's be serious here. Kleena as another topic, says Melanie Lynn. Yes, I'm not sure I'll be able to get a whole episode out of Kleena. That's the only thing. But do you know what? I'll have a look and see what I can dig up, Melanie. Uh, definitely. See you if that hasn't already been suggested, actually, already, uh, I'll, I'll add it in anyway. 
Melanie Lynn. Brilliant suggestion. And of course, we'll do our very best to make that happen for you, Melanie. I find it fascinating. My ancestry is mainly from Cork and Armagh. And the two goddesses, queens, I'm most connected to are Clina and Cork and Macha and Armagh. Fascinating stuff, Melanie. John McAndrew says, whoa, talk about a difficult birth. Cheese. <laughs> Pat Rowan is watching. Oh, Pat. Did you forget about the hour? We started we start an hour earlier on, on a Friday. Not to worry, you can catch up. Yes, indeed you did. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. No, you, you can catch up, absolutely. But it's lovely to see you anyway and to be able to get the chance to say hello to you, as always, my good friend in Washington State on the Olympic Peninsula. Nora Gaffney O'Connor, death by cheese, lol, gas. <laughs> yeah, maybe she was lactose intolerant, says Maeve. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, where am I now? Uh, one more little bit of reading, and then we're f then, then we'll finish because I've got to go and help prepare a a meal for myself and my good wife. This, like many of the accounts of Maeve in the medieval literature, was a rather spontaneous composition with no tradition behind it. Furbaya, in other accounts, indeed, was son of another sister of Maeve called Ethne. In all cases, his father is claimed to have been Concovar Magnessa. But the more usual format had him been cut out from his mother, Ethna, after she drowned in a stream. The writers were obviously dealing with a jumble of names and were arranging them in narrative order by use of whatever motifs suggested themselves. Maeve's husband, Eileel, for instance, was rather awkwardly claimed to have been a grandson of another of her sisters, Aelia. Maeve appears in a background role in several stories of the Ulster Cycle, such as The Feast of Brickrew, which we will do absolutely as an episode, The Intoxication of the Ulsterman, and The Adventure of Nera, N-E-A-R-A. -A. Though symbolising basic traits of the ancient goddess of sovereignty and of the war goddess, her character as a power-hungry virago was very much the creation of the medieval literati. Apart from some onomastic recollections, she does not figure at all in the later folklore, which is fascinating. So there you go, folks. That, for the moment anyway, is Maeve. We may get back to Maeve. Um, I have more study to do on, on Maeve and her background. And indeed, it would be nice to cover. Sorry, just before we do go, I did mention earlier uh, that, you know, um, um, Maeve's cairn at Carol Keel. And I just want to make sure... I, I wanted to just give you the local tradition from Sligo, from Queen Maeve's Cairn. And this is from Martin Byrne's wonderful website, carolkeel.com. And if you haven't got, um, uh, or if you haven't seen uh, carolkeel.com, it is a fabulous website, really fantastic. And Martin, uh, for longer than me, Lo longer than me has been researching myths and monuments and is a brilliant scholar. The passage and chamber uh, of Queen Maeve's cairn have remained hidden since prehistoric times. The cairn is currently reputed to be, the, to be the resting place of the legendary Queen Maeve of Connacht. Its good state of preservation is possibly due to her fierce reputation. Maeve ruled Connacht from her palace at Rathcrohan near Tulsk in Roscommon and she's best known for her role in Toynbo Coolinge, etc, etc. That she chose to be interred in the Great Cairn of Nochnarea says something about its prestige as the most important and ancient sacred site in Connacht. However, Maeve is not the original person buried in the Cairn, and her story seems to have been grafted onto the legend of the historical king of Connacht, Owen Bell. Owen Bell was killed in the Battle of Sligo, which occurred in 531 AD. The battle was between the men of Connacht and the ancient and their ancient enemies in Ulster. A herd of cattle was used as shock troops when Connacht men stampeded them into the ranks of their foes. The river Garavogue ran red with blood from the great slaughter. When Owen Bell was struck down, he commanded his followers to carry his body up to the mountain and bury him standing upright in the huge ancient cairn, wearing his armour with his red spear in his hand. In the year 531, at the foot of Nochnarea, the Battle of Sligo was fought, and this is from duchas.ie, which is where you'll find the school's folk, uh, folklore. It was between Owen Bell and the Northmen. The Northmen did not want Owen Bell to be king of Connacht. Both armies met at the foot of the mountain, and a fierce battle was fought. Owen Bell was mortally wounded, but he won. 
Before he died, he gave instructions how he was to be buried with his sword in his hand and his face to the north. As long as he was in that position, his men always won. Apart from her role as a semi-historical figure, Maeve seems to have been the ancient goddess of the province of Connacht. Her name translates as intoxicating one. Kings and chieftains would marry her during their inauguration rituals, which usually took place upon ancient mounds, such as Listowil or Listogil at Caramore and Heapstown Cairn. The goddess Maeve was eventually imported to Tara by the Inail, where a large Neolithic henge is dedicated to her. Take a look at that website, carokeel.com. I'll paste in that link for you below. A wonderful, wonderful resource. So, folks, that's your lot for tonight. I'll just check that there aren't any comments that I've missed. There is a book called The Gods of the Celts and Indo-Europeans by Garrett Olmsted, says Daniel Kedney. You can Google it, and it's for free. I believe it's a wonderful read. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Ronald McFadden says, sorry, I'm late. Just got out of the dentist. Ah, not to worry. Hope your mouth and your teeth are okay, Ronald. And I missed Paul uh, on the Hill of Tara. Well, not on the Hill of Tara, but Paul from the Hill of Tara area um, who was commenting earlier. Uh, Slaunch it, Paul. Somebody wants to know, uh, I know you've been focusing on Irish myths, but I wanted to know if you had any knowledge of Welsh myths. And the honest answer to that is no, uh, very, 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 very little. Not enough to do live episodes with, I don't think. Although we will encounter, as we read some of the uh, Celtic mythology books like uh, um, uh, Squire and um, Rolleston, etc., we will encounter some Welsh stuff in there. Aria says, Slán Anthony and all Gura Mahagut. Uh, Slán Gafol, Aria. See you again tomorrow evening. Daisy Peters, who's watching from uh, Brazil, says, I love this live lecture. Brilliant. Uh, D. Lynn also says, I do enjoy your lectures. Brilliant. Uh, Kujam Razalgeti says, Mata equals matter or mother. Well, mother is the more important one here. Uh, and we'll get to that because I have an episode about Mata coming up. Rosalie Reeves, sorry late again, but we'll catch up soon. No problem, Rosalie. Lovely to see you anyway. John Main says, work, work backbend. We'll watch later. Uh, and uh, John has to go to work. That's fine, John, who is in San Francisco. Uh, lovely to see you anyway. Daniel Kedney says, oh, I found the possible meaning for Eilil in Proto-Celtic. Fostered one. However, better look at the book. No problem. Seasons 136. Oh, thanks. It's Sarah from California. Thanks, Sarah. And, and no problem. Uh, I, I just hold my hands up where I don't have knowledge. I'll just say it. I'm not pretending to be something that I aren't. We fail on this in Irish education. We should learn more about our Celtic cousins. Absolutely right, Katrina. Alex says, thanks for tonight, Anthony. Again, hail Queen Maeve. Ichawa. Enjoy your date night. Thank you, Alex. Goramaha got fabulous tale. Got to run. Sloan says Ilara. Good luck and Sloan go foal. Think Maeve needs more research. She sounds wonderful. Yeah, I agree with you, Margaret. Now that's my fault. I mean, my own knowledge of her is deficient, uh, and there's probably lots and lots more. You know, go celebrate Agrina Ushla. Brilliant, Bialtana stuff. Thank you, Katrina, for that link. Great stuff, thanks. Miss the others. Is this a daily or weekly thing, says Veronica Casey? It's daily at the moment, Veronica. Has been since March the 12th. At 8 p.m. most evenings, except for Friday when we do 7 p.m. Great stuff, Anthony, says Sharon. Nora, thanks. Okay, all the people saying thanks. Brilliant. Where is Maeve buried, says Pat Rowan? In Queen Maeve's Cairn, uh, Knocknaray in Sligo, apparently. If you believe the folklore. Okay, right. Post the link. I did, I think so, uh, Margaret, didn't I? Carokeel.com, yeah, that's it there. Brilliant. Okay, folks, slong, go full. Keep safe, keep well, Come, keep coming back. Till tomorrow night for episode 51, don't forget that on Tuesday, after our uh, episode on Tuesday, we're going to do a special fire lighting ceremony and I, 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 I invite you all to join me in lighting your own little fire or your own little candle to celebrate the official day of Bialtana on Tuesday. In the meantime, we'll talk to you tomorrow evening. Sloan go full. And also YouTubers, Sloan Tosafane. <laughs>